Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here with uh, Onar and John, and we're going to be discussing uh, John. Onar is sort of my sidekick in this episode, and we're going to be discussing John's ideas. He's uh, come towards objectivism. I don't know. We'll let him speak for a second about whether he describes himself as an objectivist, but his ideas on on the importance of culture, and he wants to privatize religion because culture is important. So, John, have I been fair to your uh, stuff? Go ahead and introduce yourself. A bit. Uh, hi, I'm I'm John. Uh, I met or I, I uh, found Ayn Rand two years ago. Uh, Benito uh, helped me. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows him, but uh, he was an objectivist, or he is, and uh, he. He helped me work through like the duty because I was like caught up in my emotions and like I wasn't able to get out of the like duty to family and duty to others. And he gave me the uh, philosophy who needs it book, and that helped me a lot. Um, at that point, I I didn't understand the economy really because uh, I. Um, had always been interested more on the social side. So uh, I guess to, to go back then to start, uh, I uh, grew up in a Lutheran home, uh, was considered myself a Christian until I was 18. Um, and then I actually like started reading the Bible and realized that I didn't agree with it, but I didn't like dive deep. So I just kind of went with the, you know, you got to go to college then to, to, to figure out your job and do that. And so I kind of like coasted and then, um, I went, to, I ended up going to counseling cause I, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be then a preacher cause I just, I was always good at other people coming to me for untangling their, their emotions or, or getting help with their ideas or stuff. So, um, that was always interesting to me. And then my last year of counseling, I realized that I, I didn't agree with uh, like counseling's method of like how to approach people. Cause at the time I, uh, I was still untangling myself from Christianity. I still believed in a God, uh, but I knew Christianity was wrong. And I remember one day I just was talking with uh like a, I don't know, a 14 or 15 year old. And he was bringing up his, uh, a talk that he had with his pastor. And uh, effectively I realized that my job as a counselor is completely mute. If the, the Christian pastor is always going to trump anything I say. And if like that connection, uh, the, the, the connection between the pastor and the client and the client and Christianity if, if I can't penetrate that, then I'm, I'm totally wasting my time. And so I... Now, can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. I think that's what people like about religion. When they go to religion and find it and take it, one of the things they like about it is that it is a final answer. And everybody and everything and all the ideas that they've heard that are confusing and garbage and don't fit together... We can wipe them all away, and what we have to do is pray. Yeah. You know, and it's very, very tempting. It's a very, very easy answer. Yeah. And so, uh, okay, so I just wanted to, to, to drop that in there, that thought. So you, so you were impatient with these people who, they don't have to do any thinking, they don't have to understand anything, they don't have to uh, grasp the world, they just... Uh, except what their preacher says, or they pray, or they read the Bible, or whatever. Yeah, uh, that, and then also I realized that because um, uh, I did my uh, in counseling, you have to do an internship, and so I did my internship at a uh, an alternative school for kids with mental health issues, or social issues, or some criminal like type past. So I was working with like, you know, the real cream of the crop. And I realized that um, when I talk with them only maybe, you know, three hours at most a week, 
they're with their parents who are messing up their minds at home, you know, how many hours? And then how many years before that did they, uh, you know, have to listen to thinking the wrong way or acting the wrong way? And uh, so I, I, so it frustrated me. So then I was like, okay, I'll, I'll push that to the side and I'll eventually come back to that because that's what I want to do. But I was fortunate enough to be uh, doing well at playing uh, poker. And so I've been doing that since. And, uh, but then like on my side, on the side working on uh, developing my ideas and where to go with it and uh, what to do with it. And I think that creating a, an individual religion that's in reality that like checks all the main boxes, like, um, like I know, I know Ayn Rand is for like, you know, the top level, like, like it doesn't work for every single person. And so I wanted to then, I want to help other people move as close to that as possible with, cause I mean, it still is, it's, it's not faith based, it's reason based, it's individual based. Um, and I, and I haven't, uh, written out like my final book or, or, or you know, I'm still, uh, can I interject a little bit here? Yes. Uh, how, how old are you now? Uh, 32, 32. So, uh, I, if, if we follow the, the schedule of Ayn Rand, she says she doesn't trust, uh, any philosopher or thinker below the age of 40 because they're too immature. Uh, I, I like the, uh, Yarun Brook replied to Charles too in this way. Uh, Charles too was very uh, uh, unhappy about this, but uh, I, I uh, heard. Uh, I'm just a a adding in that I, I I'm not criticizing you trying to create a, a philosophy yeah. or something like that. Oh, that's uh, great, but do you feel that you're ready for this? Or uh, or I try to look at some of your sketches and mm -hmm. without uh, without. Uh, making any judgment or some, my immediate impression was that this needs more work, more refinement, and it, and it needs uh, it has tendencies towards rationalism, like you're creating this entire system of thought with lots of labels and lots of categories and lots of structure in it, and but n not necessarily without a good anchoring now, in reality. Are, are there is there a post or a Website or some place that you have that you that I can send the ladies and gentlemen who are watching to go uh, look right now. No, not yet. Like okay. I, that's my next plan is to then you know uh, figure it like finalize it and then uh, and then get have a, a website and like get a book out there or something. Um, so your so can I describe your larger project then maybe as um, you want to have the good things about religion without the mysticism and the, the uh, patently, obviously false things. Until what? Without yeah, I don't want the, the mysticism, but then what was the second part? The patently, obviously false things. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's, uh, uh, like, it's under reason, like I guess, it's like, uh, before I, I found Ran, uh, cause she definitely had an influence on, the like on helping me get it more to uh but it uh it, this isn't for objectivists I, I guess i haven't stated that yet but it, it's because i don't think everyone can understand objectivism and i i i just don't like i mean if there's evidence that everyone could you know but like i think what makes you what makes you believe this well, I don't know if everyone has the the IQ, the the desire to like, and I don't want to then have like. Uh, well, if they're not going to go all the way to objectivism, then like they don't have anything, and so then that's where then people will turn back to Christianity or then humanism, which humanism. I read the thing, and it was like the first 13 or 14 things is like individual, this individual, that individual, this. And then the last one is, well, we don't want any money. We want a, a non money or profit system doesn't work. And like that then collapses on itself. Like, cause 
like you need a free market for the individual in order to like, you know, like I'm, I'm, I have some evidence that, uh, that objectivism could be understood largely by society. And that is just the culture that created the constitution of the United States. They just took for granted certain things, um, that, uh, that seemed just obvious to them. They they almost didn't even put the Bill of Rights in the Constitution because it seemed so obvious to them, all of these things that are in the Bill of Rights. There was an, actually an argument about whether the Bill of Rights was necessary because all those were just obvious assumed rights. Why should we yeah. list them somewhere? So that's my evidence that we can get a culture that's really, really rational by whatever happened in the 1700s and 1600s, which, as we know, was the worship of Aristotle's um, philosophy. I have a counter-argument to that, uh, which hear. is an, uh, in alignment with John. I'm not necessarily agreeing with John on this. I'm just uh, trying to inject uh, a counter-argument, which is that the people who actually could afford to go to America before America became uh, its own nation those people were uh, cream of the crop. They uh, they were high IQ. They were well educated. They uh, had lots of uh, means or, or either money or they had a, a good family, so forth, connections. So that constituted the basic makeup of America in the beginning. And my, if you read, for instance, the what's the, what's what are these letters? The um, uh, uh, the Federalist Papers. Okay. If you've actually read those and you say, oh my goodness, uh, the, the complexity of the grammatical structure of those things is so, it's such an, on a level that about 80% of Americans today would have problems reading that. I'd go reading. higher, I'd go slightly higher than 80. Yes, I, I was being charitable. Uh, and uh, the thing is that these, uh, it paid, this was printed in a newspaper, and it was heavily read. It was like a newspaper articles, and it was incredibly popular literature. So my argument would be that that rational culture, actually, it was built up from individuals who had a very good, tight education, and they were smart individuals. Now... I disagree with John that you need to have a high IQ in order to understand objectivism because Ayn Rand's uh, superpower was that she could cut through the crap, through the fog and the philosophical haze with her laser vision and just cut out the essential definitions of things. And so she made philosophy simple. Some would say that uh, it's deceptively simple because you can fool yourself into believing that you now have the same superpowers that she had. But the point is that uh, her concepts are so easy to understand that even a simpleton can understand most of her concepts. They're, it's not difficult to understand Ayn Rand. It's quite straightforward. So that goes against uh, your idea, John, that it, people are not smart enough. So what's your take on that? There's a lot of people with an IQ of 80 to 85 or below or that. And, and I, I agree that, like, um, she does make the stuff simple. I, like, I guess one way, too, that I'm looking at it is, like, objectivists are, are doing their thing and, and bringing people in that way. And I'm trying to, I guess, move, like, uh, getting people – uh, an option that gets them close. Mm. That, like, I'm not, like, uh, uh, well, I'm not trying to be the complete philosophy like Ayn Rand is. I'm trying to give the, I'm looking at it more for the fringe people. Like, I think the, the, the cream of the crop would enjoy uh, my idea because they, st they still have kids. They still want a place to go once a week to it's because like one good thing that church does is it's like a, a group meditation where uh, you kind of wash uh, as long as it's got good values and stuff like, like obviously, but uh, it's a, it's a place where you go where you're just, you know that you're 
unconditionally accepted and it's like a, a new start for the week and that it, it's like meditation like i mean i i do meditate not now, every day but now like, you you've gone to church you grew up in church right yeah and now what do you mean when you go there and you're unconditionally accepted i grew up in church too and i didn't experience that i experienced uh cliques and um uh, ostracization and uh petty hatreds and uh, really disgusting behavior, group behavior, collectivism. That's what I experienced in church. I mean, you, you definitely get all that. And it's, and it is then like all that stuff is the first, you know, the first area. And then underneath that, everyone's, you know, uh, the submissive to Jesus, but they're like, they're connected in that. But, um, you know, I, uh, okay, so let, let's say I had you list three to five things that you want church, you want to get from church and bring with you and then leave all the garbage behind. Let's say I give you three to five things. I can think off the head of, off the top of my head of two things that I would want to bring, and that would be reverence, an idea of folding your arms and being quiet and being reverent, and the idea of being thankful for the things that you have and not taking them for granted. Now, I, I don't know if we need all the stuff that church, all the other stuff, like, okay, Christopher Hitchens said, he said, of course we don't need to go get in a group once a week and chant. That's their side. Uh, I mean, we, but we, we did that for, like, how many thousands of years, and that's, like, there's, like, there is, we are social animals, and... At some level, I'm not going to say like that's the number one thing or or anything like that. I'm I, what I'm saying is though that needs to be addressed in in an individual's life in some way, in the same way that food does. I think because what depression is is uh, is when an individual doesn't have a good connection with their own ego, their own eye, and their own direction in life, and it's also when you don't have like, uh, you don't have friends or like a group that you can go to and like relax and, and you need that because we, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's ingrained in us to some degree that it needs to be satiated. Uh, like, can I interject something here? Yeah. Uh, I've been paying attention, uh, I, to uh, like the works of people like Jordan Peterson uh, lately or in the last couple of years. And when he did, did his Bible lectures, uh, my spider senses went uh, wild because he was able to do something that pastors are not able to do. He was able to fill up a, an entire stadium with people, an entire theater with people who are willing to pay 50 bucks uh, to, to go to church or not to go to church, but hear about the Bible. Yeah. So, and, and then I, I just started paying a little bit more attention because something crazy is going on in the, in the culture at the moment. There's a hunger for something. And Jordan Peterson is tapping into that undercurrent of so what, what else suicide like. is really high. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. There was another, there was a pastor in California and I actually recommend following. I follow him on, on YouTube. Uh, I don't follow his sermons or something like that, but he has a YouTube channel podcast where he discusses ideas. He's called Paul Vanderclay. And he's, he's, he started getting into Jordan Peterson. Like he's a past actual pastor with a real church. And he started putting out videos discussing Jordan Peterson because he says it, we, we see churches dying all around us. So why is this guy, who is not even a Christian, able to gather people to start talking about the Bible? What the hell is going on? Uh, uh, and so it, it turns out that when I started listening to him, he's a very sympathetic guy. Uh, he's very good at talking. And he's, he's pretty good at reasoning as well. And he, he's a good listener. He's a pastor, so he's been listening to bums and people who have problems all his life, just like you were talking, John, that you were a good listener. And you, so he has this practice 
of talking to other people. And so when I hear him engaging with other people, I can see that he he's doing something that a lot of people can learn from. But my point was, he's now starting up some colloquial groups, like on Meetup, meetup.com, where, pe- where people are discussing Jordan Peterson. And people are gathering there in group groups, but there's no cliques there, as, uh, as Brandon was uh, talking about, is that people are actually coming there voluntarily to discuss ideas, and therefore there is this kind of social bond, because they have been attracted for the same reasons to come to precisely this place. Mm-hmm. So there is something there about this interaction. If it's if it's just a rote, if it's just part of your, something you do on Sundays, then you're going to get social cliques and all of this. But if you do it voluntarily, then it's... Oh, it, I, it's completely voluntary. I wasn't... Now, like, we used to have discussion societies and debate societies. Yeah. And a debate society is a great place to go when the town is all upset about stuff. Everybody goes down to the debate society. When everything's calm, there's nobody down there. So right. maybe a debate society is the type of thing. I mean, what exactly? You, so you want a secular religion, but what exactly are you going to have? Are we going to sit in the pews and chant things together like, we believe in individual rights? No, uh, like... There would be singing and, and stuff like that where you, uh, and I guess stories of, um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do all the, like what services, how that would work out. My idea was more of, um, since everyone is the centerpiece in their life, like no one, everyone spends a hundred percent of their life in their life at most someone else spends 3%. So, uh, but so stories are good ways to deal with some of the hard times or some of the, um, just everyday times and, uh, and characters like, like help propel you uh, and give you energy to, you know, keep, are you talking about something a little bit uh, like uh, Alcoholic Anonymous, uh, AA? No, but like I see that as like a form of like religion type thing where people voluntarily come in a group and they have uh, where they are, uh, they each have like their one-on-one person who sees them completely naked, who uh like you know vulnerable like however and um and they're honest with them and they and uh they have that kind of community and i mean it is similar like to that is what i'm uh because like i do see religion as a public family that you're that you can then uh go to based on the the values that you uh have or that it has um and if i I can try to interject some kind of criticism again, because when I was listening to Paul Vanderclay, he discusses the split in the split in the church, where you have uh, the the social conservatives or the conservatives part, those who want to actually believe in God, and then you have the so-called progressive part of the church that wants to have all the church stuff, but without God. So there's a, there are places uh, where you have the pastors who have told their parish that they now no longer believe in God, but they're still pastors. And uh, so you have these uh, tendencies for churches for forming around a very secular idea. But as both Jordan Peterson has observed and Paul Vanderclay, Paul Vanderclay as a pastor, it's that that's just one step in the direction of of a dying church like so none of the churches are able that go secular are able to sustain themselves as far as it looks like from the pattern so are you familiar well, with this kind of thing and if, how will you do things differently if if such churches had been able to sustain themselves we would see that phenomenon in the world but we don't see it i mean there must have been secular churches in the past where some pastor got up and said you know what I don't believe it anymore. And where are they? You know, the Mormon church came out of nowhere and became big, but 
where did the secular churches go? So it seems pretty, you know, Freud said we're going to have religion as long as people are afraid of the dark. So we, maybe we're stuck with it. I don't know. I'm really worried about what you think is valuable about religion. I can, there's like, you know, I grew up under it and there's so many bad things. I, I just can't. <laughs> Can, can you list some bad things for the for the audience? Yeah, the group the group think that comes into it. You like it takes over society, and in order to in order to open a business, you have to be in friendly with the church. In order to um, get a nice house in a nice neighborhood, you have to know the right realtors or the the bankers. The bank own the people at the at the banks they go to church the guy who owns the grocery store goes to church <laughs> and it becomes more than a place to gather it becomes the backdrop of everything and it becomes a thought control situation now in, in utah under the mormons it's a little different because they own the whole state and so it's a very it's like uh, uh like i experienced the religion religion the way that no american generally does you have to grow up in a really tightly religious society to see these thought control things and um like 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 virtual censorship but thought control i think is the best the best uh thing yeah the best so you, the best description did you did you grow up in uh, in utah under uh, mormonism yeah in a small okay, so town you, now i think that there are, are some uh pastors out there that would in inject them that they sort of take a, a difference with lumping all religion in under the same umbrella as Mormonism. Well, I'm, I'm saying Mormonism stands out from the other religions because um, it owns the entire culture. It's not just one church in the society. It owns Utah. And so... That's how your 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 dentist and your grocer and the police officer who pulls you over they all go to church. If you don't go to church, you're left out. You're excluded. You're part of a lower class. You're the untouchable if you don't go to church in Utah. Notice that this is what we already have today with the progressive church. That if you're not part of the left, you're left out. Yeah. Uh, so in Hollywood, it, that's a, a, a deeply a progressively religious place, so you have to profess your uh, progressive credentials in order to get a job. Including the the green the green party, which is if if we can quit believing in God and keep religion, I'll bet it would look something like the green party, where we worship uh, our grandfather's green, clean mountain air and stuff like that. So, do be careful, John. You're playing with fire with this religion stuff. <laughs> Well, the way that I look at it, too, is, like, uh, I think this is a better way of doing, uh, like, a counseling office. Because this would give, um, like, with how I was talking with uh, the clients, with their families. And if their families are, are you know, bad or, or whatever, then um, this this allows me to be more involved in people's lives to, to then give, uh, like it, it's more, there will be some services for like the singing and, and stuff like that. Cause I, I do enjoy that, but, um, and I know there's other people who enjoy that kind of stuff, but, uh, I'm looking at it as more as a place that then individuals can come to then, uh, it gives me more freedom than going into a counseling office. That's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not like, so you're coming from the, the background of wanting to be able to counsel people and help them, help them in their lives from the background of counseling. And you want to be able to provide the services that counselors provide in a secular background. Um, so, something like a secular debate society for lonely people, a secular intellectual, a secular, not, you don't want to be intellectual about it, right? You're just, just for the average Joe. Well, it's not like, it's, 
I'm uh, I'm not trying to stand in in their way. I'm like more of their. Uh, I'm I'm trying to have as as little like uh, dogma or whatever you want to call it as like. So as it's not you're not disseminating some uh, viewpoint. You're just there for people. Yeah. All right. So something like the YMCA, sort of. Uh, I somewhat, but like not Christian, not that. No, of course. Now the YMCA being run by the Christians, um, you can go there and get a room or whatever, and if you're homeless, yeah. and you don't necessarily have to pray to Christ or anything. But if people don't give them another option for a different thing to take over some of that kind of stuff, then we're always going to have to work through the Christ uh, YMCA or, or... Right. So, no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that... Uh, like, all I'm saying is I'm trying to figure out what you're proposing. Yeah. So a YMCA, but a secular version of the YMCA, sort of. Kind of. I mean, I not... Yeah, like... Now, if, if you had a million dollars and you called me and you said, I'm starting this tomorrow, I would come down there and I would say, okay, over in this room, we're going to have a trade school class. We're going to teach kids how to drill stuff and build furniture and, and work with plumbing. That's, that can be part, like, <coughs> um, excuse me. Like, I do actually plan on then having, uh, like, a library <coughs> that we take care of that is just for kids to read and uh and do their their education of themselves without like so that way then because uh, that would be better than leaving it up to the states too. And, and I'll I'll add just for um, to second that I'll add Benjamin Franklin's public libraries and the subscription libraries that they started in in early United States of America. And the libraries are also like a place you can go and yeah. learn and. Uh, find out information about the community and stuff so um so we're gonna have a public <clears throat> library and events and uh well like, it's not it's it's part of that like i mean i guess public can come but like it's more for than the uh the kids i guess i don't know well but a I local guess, a local library yeah yeah that's because i mean that's how i'm looking at it is like because not every one has a family and then also within your family you have conflicts and things that like you, you know you just have that sometimes and one thing that I do remember that I really enjoyed about church was uh being like if I was having conflict with my father or my brother or someone else and we weren't able to to do it then you know uh we were able to go and talk to our pastor and they were able to mediate and um and so it's like having a, a public local family that you can then that uh because one thing that i think would tremendously help our society is if we had a place where then like your emotions can kind of like dissipate like uh, uh like earthquake you know like eventually it dissipates out and slow you know understand what i mean yeah now and, and uh, um, here, I want to offer a proposal from the ancient Greek system for this, because you're going to have like a leader of the local temple uh, or some some guy who's there to talk to people or something, and it could be as non-specific as just like in my town we had a scout leader or the scout leaders, and it was just two of the guys from the town, and it just whoever wasn't busy this year and could help out was the scout leader. And in ancient Greece, they had a system where uh, they would just draw a lottery, and the citizen who was picked was that was like the president of that group for the year, and he didn't have a choice, and so they never knew which citizen it was going to be. It was just one of the 100 citizens in the group or whatever, and there wasn't an election or anything, and he couldn't be reelected, and he couldn't take power, and he was out one year from now, so it could be a local citizen just elected for one year, uh, <clears throat> however, um, by, uh, by agreement of a group or whatever. So I'm going to want you to have a priest of some kind there to help the kids run the drills or whatever. There's going to have to be some sort of staff. 
and yeah. teaching the classes, however big it is, one guy or ten guys. What's your vision of that? For the for like teaching kids? Oh, I don't know. For everything okay. I said. What? For everything I said. What's your vision of all the stuff I covered? <laughs> yeah, thinking you uh, pick one and. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice cop out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I uh, interject something here? Yeah. There's some, um, like, I, I love this idea of meetup.com uh, because you do have uh, organizations. You can make your own uh, or organizations there based on topics. And one of the things that they you have there is like these maker societies, maker groups, maker community. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. But that's basically like you get a, a whole. Thing. They have 3D printers. They have all sorts of tools for doing electronics and for uh, woodwork. And yeah, I, I plan on like it, since. I mean, the other religions, you know, let's study this book, you know, on and on and on and on. And um, like one. <clears throat> I look at it as like a place that people can come to and then practice out their, like, I guess a simple one is if like someone's a singer and they want to then, um, but I guess, uh, like for more, I'm thinking more like younger kids, not like a, an adult singer, like it, if you're uh -huh. an adult singer by that time, you know what you're doing, but like kids to learn, like gives them a, 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 a semi public, setting to like start uh learning how to deal with some of the stuff of like being an adult yes and like and trying new things it sounds very ambitious uh, uh i'm I, I wish i had the same kind of uh, energy to be able to have that kind of ambition myself um but it's it sounds uh, interesting definitely what uh, what has happened with me lately like in the last couple of years uh, is that uh, I have uh, rekindled my interest in religion as a phenomenon, generally, like from a psychological perspective, based on my, uh, following Jordan Peterson. I, I do think like the like religion, like primitive philosophy, is like covers the same area as psychology, and I, I may so be wrong, but that's. I, 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 I just have a new sense of understanding of what religion is for. Uh, and it's the it's a different kind of language than the rational language. Uh, and in like Jonathan Haidt talks about uh, free will, the rational mind being the, the elephant rider. And then you have like a big unconscious blob of subconscious processes and ancient structures in your mind that he calls the elephant uh, so you, you you can the elephant rider is trying to control the subconscious now Ayn Rand uh, talks about the the function of art art is her substitute for religion and I think it's either in the romantic manifesto or in the art of fiction she says that the purpose or function of art is to give you a way of consuming value your values uh in a non-conceptual manner i've got and it i've got it let's open up ayn rand <laughs> art and community centers and they'll be subversive uh outlets for her philosophy and nobody will suspect I, it because it's an art an art community center i I, I, mean, I do plan on like every like every library would have to have uh, at least a section of her books and stuff because they she did help me and and um, and I want people to have that option to go to I I I I'm not worried about like I guess finishing people off as objectivists I'm I'm more focused on helping yeah. them get the no yeah you can you can only push them so far, they will have to make their own choices. But just to finish off of the elephant is that um, religion uh, and art share something. Uh, they speak not to the rational mind, but to the elephant. Uh, so elephant 
Elephantes is the language of art, of prophecy, of religion, of emotion, of metaphor, of narrative, storytelling, myths. So uh, it, when you're speaking in that Elephantes language, then uh, you're speaking in a way that is, circumvents your entire rational mind. And Ayn Rand makes also that point that that is the purpose of art, to circumvent your rational mind so that you can have a pure emotional experience of art. And there's something there going on also with religion, that religion speaks not to your rational mind, obviously, uh, although there, there are some good like rules of thumb and rules of life yeah. there. But much of the value of uh, of religion is captured in these ancient myths and stories that somehow have been naturally selected that turns out to be just really good stories to tell and then when you hear those stories you get an emotional response from them that's why they've survived across eons and across many generations so this is a point that uh, uh, Jordan Peterson also makes that, like Sam Harris, in his, his in his debate with Sam Harris, Sam Harris says, well, I can just go into the library and just open any book, and I can create a myth on the fly, just reading from any book. Now, it occurs to me as you speak that the Greeks had myths about, um, they didn't have mythical myths, they had, uh, like, myths about humans, like, all of the stuff the Greeks' gods did were human activities. <laughs> and uh, like cheating and lying and all this stuff. So um, you could have like a, you could study ancient myths and, you know, like like um, in the 1800s, it was just a given that every school kid was going to learn about ancient Greek, Greek mythology. Everybody knew their Greek mythology. Yeah. And, and, like, they, and, uh, and we don't, there's no cult of Zeus today because of that. We didn't like turn back into a Zeus worshiping culture. Precisely. And, and there's yeah, value, in, there's a lot of value in those Greek mythologies. Yes. And like uh, in, in one of our previous videos, I just like referred to the, the omnipresence of the potential for evil in our hearts across generations, which is like mm -hmm. the story uh, of, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, the evil um, from the Garden of Eden. Oh, um, that's right. Yeah, original sin, and I say there's always a, there will always be a snake in the garden. Oh. Now, this this snake in the garden metaphor allows you to communicate an idea that's much more complicated than that. But it's like you, with almost with no words, you're 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 bringing forth an image in your mind, which is incredibly suggestive to the to your subconscious mind and I, I think that a lot of other stories in the Bible that have survived and also not just in the Bible but in in Greek mythology and probably in all mythologies that mm -hmm. have survived then the value comes from that these stories convey com communications and have been naturally selected because of their communicable uh, abilities something like that 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 is one of the, like the main that's like one of the main things that I want to add part of it is each person has their own, like it, we're in an objective reality. Like I'm not trying to have them come up with their own mythology that suddenly they're, you know, a fictional character and this is all fictional, but I want everyone to have their own, like their own mythology story or something that like, uh, because understanding stories and being able like obviously there's going to be a giant spectrum of quality but um but like understanding stories and characters uh helps people understand their emotions and unwind themselves and and if you can unwind people's emotions and help them to understand them better then rather than like i'm making up numbers but like if emotions take up 20% of your energy, then if you can get someone to be very good at understanding them and like having uh, control over their emotions and uh, that it, you might be able to get it down to only taking up 5% of energy. I would caution you against wasting too much uh, concern about our culture today and like setting up a, 
If you want to set up a long-term cultural institution that's going to last for 100 or 200 years, just realize that the people around us today are sick, sick people. And that uh, as soon as we get our, our education system fixed and a few uh, intellectual things sorted out, it's going to start moving in a better direction because there's a bankruptcy today. There's an emptiness and a vacuum, and it's going to be filled by something. And hopefully it'll move in a better direction. I am I'm skeptical about places like France, but I think America's moving in a better direction. So, France is um, not in a good direction. I saw Germany's like 42% of their next generation's immigrants. Yeah, see, now what's it's going to be it's going to be uh, Muslim Europe in 20 or 30 years. So yeah. um but uh, without it's, getting depressed it, about it, I think that there's a positive future. No, I don't think that it, it, it's true that uh, or, uh, Europe is going to be Muslim. What's going to happen is that one or two nations is going to to go suicide, right? And all the other ones are going to say, "Oh shit, we're not doing that." Yeah. So they're going to pull back from the brink. That's but aren't they going to be able to? Like Yes, they will. And they they will do it with wild violence if necessary. This, is, this has happened before. So uh, one people people don't understand about the Germans particularly, or it's true about uh, North Europeans, is that Germans are very polite. Very, very polite. And they're very tolerant. Very, very tolerant until they're not. And when they're not, they get very, very angry. They get get these rage things. So you can see in Germany, this is crazy. Everything is completely ordered. People are moving, the traffic is moving really nicely, everything. And then all of a sudden, bam, you have this chaos. And then just things orders up after all the killing and slaughtering is finished. So uh, don't underestimate the Germans. Even if they're like doing, uh, are being very tolerant right now, uh, this may end up in uh, a slaughterhouse, uh, and that's I'm not saying that's a good thing. That's one of the reasons I'm trying to prevent that from happening because I know that everyone says, "Oh, Muslims will take over," but uh, it, Euro Europeans have a history of fighting whenever it's necessary, and they if, if well, not if it, not the French. That's true. So maybe maybe France will fall, but I think that a lot of us... They got one objectivist now, though. <laughs> yeah. One. He's, I told him to come to America. I said, get the hell out of there. Yeah. Probably France is not worth it. But uh, it's sad because France is a beautiful country. Uh, if you ignore Paris. <laughs> I thought that was the only good thing they had was the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you go to Paris, you will understand what I mean. There are no Frenchmen living in Paris. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that, too. And there's pretty soon going to be no Frenchmen living in France, so they won't even have a country to, ca to capitulate. It'll just be a Muslim country tomorrow. It'll just, like the Soviet Union just collapsed, France will just disappear. No, uh, and once you go out into the wilderness, in other words, outside Paris, there's almost only Frenchmen. That's where all the French people live. Hmm. Well... Um, okay, well, back to the subject, John, I guess, uh, yeah. what, did, what should we, what should we do then? What do we, how do we move forward with your, your idea for secular community centers, secular community centers? I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's a fair way of looking at it. Like, what's your magnet that's going to get people there? Just, um, just sort of being like the public library, the place to go for. Well, I for... think I think that like uh, I, I don't think there. I think people want to have like a public family type thing and like a place, but they don't want it to be like a singular event. Which is why like then religion can be anywhere because if anyone actually then wanted to do it this way, then they could do it that way. Um, you want to do a community type where, where it's yeah. long term. Yeah. I mean, you, you could look at it as like, if you wanted to, as like a playground where uh, there will be one person who's volition, like who clearly wanted to step up and, and do this kind of thing. Now I, I will make, I will have zero tolerance for pedophilia and, 
or, or using money in the wrong way. I don't know what, like, the extent I can do that. I had to talk to a lawyer about that stuff, but, like, I want it 100% to be a place that a mother or a father can bring their kid and, okay, this kid is safe. So, like, you know, uh, you know I'm sure there'll be a daycare at some point you know, that people could use that as an option. Kind of, uh, but, like, yeah, you could look at it as a playground that people come together to, you know, have their adult recess and hang out with their buddies you know, once in a while. Or if they um, need to, then go see a instead of like going to see a counselor, then they just go see their the the person, the principal or the preacher, however they're individually looking at it. Like, because I I am trying to make it as customized, like customized church experience within these like like not just anything goes like obviously i have a, a, some like um uh rules or the things that i, I sent you guys but uh i'm very curious uh it sounds very interesting and i'm very curious if you're able to succeed with this because i think that there are, are people who have tried to make communities like this and um, it's been a mixed success. I haven't seen in like secular societies uh, fill that niche or that role. Uh, all the religionists do it, but uh, uh, the secularists are like herding cats. Uh, they go, I mean, they do have their religions like guys and like environmentalism and stuff like that, but not in the communal sense that you're talking about. So I'm, I'm very curious about uh, how, if you will succeed and how you will go about doing it. I am too. <laughs> I, my, uh, the background of my thing is um, throughout the century, there were men who took first steps down new roads armed with nothing but their own vision. That's true. And I... I yeah, I, I totally understand why everyone like use it in this, and I and I I like I've been trying to work on this and not work on this and then work on this and then and then not work on it because it's like I understand the how it could go wrong. Uh, like if you wanted to, um, uh, you guys seen Apollo thirteen? Yeah. Uh, where they. It's like skipping off the atmosphere. Like it could go good or it could go bad. And so, like I did spend a lot of time trying to make sure it's as like uh, blockers for it going bad. Like I, I understand. Yeah, I'm pretty um, sure. Pretty sure it's gonna go bad. I'm pretty sure. You have the odds against you, but that's why I'm very curious to see if you are actually able to crack the formula. I, uh, I just like the idea of people having their own, like, like their, their public family that they can retreat yeah. to. Like, like, let's say a, a civil war does start. Where's everyone going to run to? Their YMCA? Like... You know, if uh, are they going to run to your secular uh, community well, center? If it was big enough that enough people were not, they wouldn't run there, but they would know. Like, I don't know. It, it it would provide the background for a community basis in case of conflict. Yep. You would, act, you would at least be connected to a bigger network of individuals who are fighting for individual freedom and, you know, uh, reason and and all those values rather than, you know, you're left with your hands up with just then your family at your house. I mean, what else are the options? So you want to get people when they're young and uh, influence them positively with uh, positive values instead of the cultural nihilism and religion that we have. There is a point to life. Definitely not nihilist. Like, it, the, the, I, and, yeah. Oh. 
All right. Yeah. The, well, the best thing I could think of there was uh, the like trade school stuff, teaching them actual skills and stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I I agree with that completely. Like how I actually look at it with like me, and I don't know when I'm going to start this. Obviously, it depends on if there's people who even want to try something like this. But like you know, I I personally like to write, so I can always write. You know, at the, the church or the playground, however uh, people view it, but or m- maybe I'll want to do glass blowing for or, or, or something that then I'm working on, and I'm then and one thing that that will do is uh, it'll help kids learn that there is a process to understanding stuff and like learning and, and give yeah. them a place to try out new places or new things, and and because. I, it, I think it helps. It does help when you do something public in front of other people. It, like it helps you gain confidence. And and I I want a place that kids can go that they don't have to worry about pedophilia or other like. I mean, I I hated myself growing up. Like the way that I looked at uh, uh, Christianity was the. The absolute best I could be was 99% John. If I was ever 100% John, that was the absolute worst. Because if I'm 100% John, I, there's no room for Jesus, and that means hell. You know? And, like, that's obviously, like, you don't want that. <laughs> and, um, but. So you want room for the individual? Go ahead, Onar. Jump in if yeah. you were going to. Um, no, I, I was uh, I was just going to say that um, YouTube they uh, got big on cat videos. See, uh, they, you start with something that has appeal uh, just to a lot of people, and then you have a, a, a sub culture growing up from uh, from that around the cat videos. So. Uh, in, in this sense, like if you have some kind of activity which just draws people there, it doesn't have to necessarily be anything like mm-hmm. uh, philosophical, it just needs to be something that, oh, there's a reason to go there. But then yeah. when, when you have this community that's a, a, an arena for talking, for interchanging ideas, for, uh, for, for communion, Something like that, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know what your next step is with it. Uh, I I wish you luck on on the attempt. Like I say, I, I, I'm afraid for it because even if you get it perfect, then the next step is it will go downhill. Once, you, Because as they say, the, <clears throat> that's the only thing that can happen to something that's perfect is it goes downhill. But... Um, <clears throat> um, so, so I'm just wondering, you, you said it's just going to be a neutral place for people to go, but it's going to be a gathering place for people who are in favor of individual rights and freedom. So is it going to be disseminating these ideas actively or not? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not like, not at that point of exactly uh, having it figured out, but like, yeah, I'm trying to like, you mean like in the public or like within the, within with the, within it, within it, yeah, yeah, within uh, like, yeah. Are, like the, I, are the kids going to attend reason and oh. an individual freedom? I mean, reason is like, you know, the the top value in it too. Like I, um, an individual human flourishing is, you know, the I, I try to break it down. The fact that I mean, we are like ninety five percent monkey. Or something that that is, you know, emotional based. Or so I understand why the psychologists say that that is a huge part of it because I mean it is in there. But if we want to be civil, then we have to have our 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 foundation on reason, on individual rights, you know, and and address you know the other stuff. But like the monkey mind is, if you characterize it as one thing, it's it is greedy, uh, short term though, you know, but humans are able to do long-term and the thing that the distinguishing characteristic of 
you know, a human is reason. The moment we discovered reason was the moment we realized we had two options and that was when free will came in. You know, and like, and if we want to achieve long-term happiness, that we have to use reason. And I think it's like, the more you can teach kids and, and adults that, then you know, uh, that just kind of ripples and spreads out, you know? Yeah. And I don't think it necessarily has to be taught um, like... Uh... Like, you don't have to all sit there and read Ayn Rand if you just teach a kid uh, math correctly and reading correctly and have him read good literature correctly. When he gets older, then Ayn Rand will make sense to him if he hasn't been polluted with bizarre ideas and stuff. And every single church will have a section with all her books. So everyone will have a access to it from ground up. I have to admit, if I walked past such a place, I would think it was a little bit bizarre and wonder what's going on, but I, I don't know if I could be against it. It was just a, just a secular YMCA um, with, with better values and ideas, right? That's the idea. And I, I know that people, like, not everyone needs a, a, a singing service every week. That's, that's 100% true. Not everyone needs it. There are some people who would probably come in two times a year, you know, and, and I would probably have a two hour conversation with that individual and, you know, and that would probably be it for the whole year, you know, but that's the kind of check in with, with them and like, and, and I wouldn't say, Hey, you haven't been in naughty, naughty, you know, it's, you have to come to me. I'm, I guess I wanted to create a place where I could be the counselor that I wanted to in my way without having to worry about government overlooking me and, and trying to regulate how I talk to people or how I do everything. And, um, and I wanted it to be more the, the person driven because if you're coming to me, then you you're taking the first step on your own. And cause it, because if you don't want to be there, there's zero point in me wasting my time talking to you. If you if your elephant's got its eyes closed and it's you know there's there's no point. That's interesting. So it comes. So part of your impetus comes from the fact that in order to try to be a positive influence on people with your knowledge of psychology, you have to jump through a bunch of government hoops, and you're frustrated with that. Well, I mean, I I didn't. I didn't go into the field after my, uh, uh, my internship. So, you know, I didn't have to experience it firsthand, but I did talk to other people who just talked about paperwork. And then also my internship was in an, in a alternative public school. So I had a rough idea of how much, uh, paperwork and like, and a lot of it's just kind of like BS, like just, nonsense and it was just like okay this this is stupid and what am, am i able to into because at some point i will have to chew someone out if, if i'm going to really connect with them you know obviously they've come to me you know this is if, if we want to use the aa example this would be then you know someone messing up and going to their their sober person um i, I forget the exact name but is it sober or but either way they go to their their person and they they confess they're, so, they're not confessing their sins like you tell me I'm bad or anything. They're just being honest and open about themselves vulnerably completely. And then, I mean, there might be a time where I have to do that. You know, you know, not cross the line, but like, you know, do it in the way that's appropriate for that individual. And, and you're just limited, I think, because government limits everything. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it really does. And I, the way that, like, uh, I, I, like, two months on the carnivore diet, and uh, my brain feels great. Like, I, I have a calm in it. And a lot of uh, what uh, they think is, like, now that your brain's no longer starving and looking for nutrients, it, it can calm down and then, like, focus. And if... Um, like 
the like I said earlier, like the emotions. Like if you can make people help people become better accustomed to their like understand their emotions and be in control. Because I don't I don't know what the percent is, but I would imagine that a high percent of people doing stuff that they immediately regret is due to not like emotional spazzing or like you know not. And yeah, and if you can help people be in control of their emotions and have reason and have, you know, uh, like the math thing. When I was in second grade, they uh, they sent me out in the hall because I was uh, I understood whatever math we were working on, and they they had me learn Roman numerals. What like that's that doesn't help me, <laughs> you know. Like, have a place where then kids can do schooling properly. Did you go to a public school? Yes. I, uh, in Norway, there's an entire educational philosophy built around doing exactly what happened to you. It's, and it's in, it's the part of the social democratic way of thinking. It's called the, the Unity School. How scary a name is that? Yeah. <laughs> is that like, so, Greta, uh, Greta saying we're united behind the earth, the united science, whatever the one article she said. Well, it, it could be something like that, but now I'm talking about just as an educational philosophy, and the idea is that everyone should have equal outcome yeah, in, from school. So basically, uh, you try, you put all the resources in the people who su- who are struggled the most, you know, to lift them up to the average, and then you hold back those who are above average so that they become like average. Um, so if, if they complete their task before others, they put them into uh, useless stuff like learning the, the Roman numerals. This is exactly what happened to me too. And when I was growing up, I didn't know that this was actually something that was done on purpose. I didn't not, either. not to help me, but to destroy me. It's part of an actual philosophy. Uh, so that's I just wanted to mention that since you experienced that uh, the way I did Roman numerals for my students was uh, I taught it to them and then I, I quizzed them on it and the ones who really wanted to understand it were free to understand it and answer the quiz questions and get the cash and the ones who weren't that interested in it never came to understand it as well and um, but overall, they all came to understand it under their own steam because uh, otherwise it cost them owl, owl dollars and uh, they wanted to earn owl dollars, so they decided to learn it. So uh, that was... <laughs> That's great. And uh, let me just mention real quick while I'm on that, um, that uh, I, I had a surplus of yard at my school. There was like flower beds that were dirty and stuff. And I had a shortage of labor to clean up the stuff. So I fixed the problem by causing a shortage of yard by offering the kids plots in the yard so that they could clean it up and do what they want with it. And I auctioned off the yard to the school kids so they had their little plots in the flower bed. So before, these pieces of uh, ground they had no care about, weren't interested in, all of a sudden, it was theirs. It was ownership, and uh, they loved their little section, four foot long section of a flower bed. They cleaned it out and they got ready to plant it in the spring and stuff. So create shortages, and that creates value. I learned. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Before we had all this extra space, and now I said, "Here's the problem, guys. We don't have very much space out there, and I'm now going to give you the chance to buy it, but there's not a lot of space." Yes. In in fact. I mean, many people uh, talk about the wonders of abundance. There's like books coming out that now we're entering an age of abundance and it's utopia and hallelujah. But when I hear abundance, I I hear a desert. Uh, Like um, it's a meaning crisis because we human beings are, uh, are evolved to deal with limited resources. So... If we have abundance, we lose meaning, we lose the anchor in reality. So we actually need to have 
uh, uh, lack of abundance. We need to have a well, I, shortage. I don't believe in this abundance trope. The first place I know of it being used was like 170 years ago when these factories were producing massive amounts of cotton clothing uh, and you compare it to the old wool clothing and it wears out pretty easy and pretty quick but it's also one twentieth the price it's really cheap so people are wearing all this cloth and coat clothing and it was seen as a sign of poverty at the sign at the time that people couldn't afford good old wool cloth they had to wear this cheap cotton and in fact it was a revolution in cleanliness because you could get a new shirt every year you didn't have to make a shirt that wore for twenty years so, um, uh, so that was where they were screaming their heads off about too much abundance. This is creating, uh, it's creating poverty. Our abundance is creating poverty, they actually said. Abundance going overboard. And then in the 1930s, too much abundance. We've got to seize uh, oranges from the farmers and burn them. We've got to take cattle from the farmers and slaughter them and bury it. They burned the carcasses and buried it. So nobody can yeah, go the the Luddites, yeah. So this is modern Luddites. These are modern Luddites. But what I was talking about was actually the opposite of what you're talking about. Is it though? Uh, but go ahead. Uh, I think it's the Venus Project. Uh, yes, the VenusProject.com. Beyond politics, poverty, and war, resource-based economy, and they are big into this notion that uh, of creating abundance, but abundance, abundance, abundance. And they're, they're like saying, if we can just create a world of infinite abundance, then all problems will disappear. That's their view. So they're utopian abundanists. Uh, and I say it as a response to that, if we had abundance in every area, no struggle, nothing to work for, then we <coughs> see a lot of unhappy people because we're biologically... Uh, designed or de by evolution to deal with shortages we need to have something to work with so uh, this idea of not having to work anything any day in your life everything just comes for free it's very socialist uh, utopian ideas yeah this is uh, this Venus project looks very utopian it says preparing for the day when money will be meaningless so if we Precisely have because of abundance, that, that's we, what the humanists basically the last one of theirs said. No, we're always going to have shortages. I guarantee it because absolutely, no matter how much stuff you produce, I myself am going to want more. So, <laughs> like, it doesn't matter how much you guys make. Like, I'm going to want a spaceship to take New York City to Mars. If you guys get rich enough, I'm going to want that. So, like, we're never going to have enough money around here. So. Um, yeah, abundance is a is a is a myth and a, a com, uh, what a, an illusion on the horizon. And the universal basic income is based on the idea of this coming abundance. Yes, it's crazy stuff. Yeah, Peter Thiel very recently did a talk with uh, Eric Weinstein, and uh, it's that is, they they talk about this. Peter Thiel says, I don't. We've been talking about this coming abundance boom for about 40 years now, and it's never actually arrived. I like Peter Thiel a lot. Uh, he he uh, alerted me to the fact that while everyone is talking about uh, progress, 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 he says progress stopped in almost all areas 50 years ago, around 1970. Yeah. That's yeah. when we sent someone to the moon. We never did it again. Uh, we had the Concorde that was flying faster than the speed yeah. of sound. We don't have that anymore. We I had, think that some people are trying to bring that back. As of course, yes. But we're, my point is, uh, right. almost everything stopped. Cars go on average slower today due to traffic jams than they did in the 1970s. Same mm -hmm. with trains, same with airplanes. Transportation goes slower. And education is more expensive. Healthcare is more expensive. Housing is more expensive than before. Now, so, I, I would just add one extra note to Peter Thiel there. I would say, I would say, I don't know if there was much progress uh, after 1905 or so, because we had planes, trains, and automobiles 
electricity, phones, telegraph. And so from 1905 forward, we just improved on those. What did we invent from 1905 forward? Okay, even if I grant you that, it's still progress in the sense that they were sort of doing stuff. The things were improving. The, the, the airplanes in 1905 are not as good as the one that's produced in 1970. Right? <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Slide but, up, right? but the airplanes that are produced in 1970 are almost indistinguishable from the airplanes that are produced today. Yeah. And notice how many skyscrapers were built in America recently. The last one was World Trade Center. And I'm talking about the one in 1972. Okay. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did build them right, right back then. That's true. Okay. Well, I mean, so we have had immen immense progress, but in the unregulated areas of our economy. Yes. That's... And and the the, pro the problem is that we're so focused on the, the 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 new fancy new mobile phones and and the electronics where most of the innovation has taken place. That we're not paying attention to the fact that if we ignore them, ignore that part of the economy, ev almost everything has gotten worse. Like, I was shocked to find out the following: is that people talk about that uh, uh, bacteria are now evolving resistance to antibiotics, and I was in my mind just like, no, of course they are, because uh, evolution, microbe evolution, it works quite fast. But then I heard the last antibiotics we developed was in the 1960s no new antibiotics since then 50 yeah, years there's no, there's no uh economic incentive for it because people get on antibiotics and they're on them for three days or five days or a week and it, it's better to get them on a pill that they have to take every day for the rest of their life so all of the all the research goes into long-term pills well, here's the thing. When you look at the number of, of patents and number of approved uh, medicines uh, he, he has, uh, from FDA, then it's going down, down, down. And the price per approved drug goes up, up, up. Now, that's the real root of the problem. If we got the FDA yep. out of there and the price wasn't so damn expensive to get a drug to market, then people would bring out drugs that were less expensive. <clears throat> So yes. we would have, we would, they would, if it, if it, if they could get a drug to market for five or ten million dollars instead of, I mean, literally the cost is a billion dollars to get a drug to market, literally. So um, it was that, I saw yes. something where uh, I forget the names, but it uh, was was some company that I think crashed not that like within the last four or five years that was a drug company that basically was just going around and buying up all the like other drugs, but then would just uh, do away with their R and D and just jack up the price and and like uh, they they were like we're not gonna find any new drugs, so we'll just do away with R and D and just keep pushing the ones that we had. Yeah. I forget the name of it. It was, um, but yeah, well, like they weren't interested in new drugs at all. <laughs> well, almost no one is interested in new drugs. Yeah, those. It's there's a certain amount of hope for the single payer tax system so they don't have to worry about new drugs just just take over the monopoly and start to collecting money and uh, because now the average time to get approval of, of a new drug is like more than 10 years it's like approaching 15 years so average approval time for FDA you still have to patent it like 15 uh, and the clock starts ticking from when you patent it, not when it enters the, the market. So they only have like three or five years of uh, patents remaining when it's actually on the market. So what the drug companies did is that we need to defend ourselves so we can actually earn some money. So what they did is that they convinced the bureaucrats, and it was easy to do, they convinced the bureaucrats to uh, say, well, if someone else is going to create a copy when the uh, copy uh, when the patent expires, they too need to go through exactly the same EPA uh, FDA approval process, even though it's a safely proved drug. And in this way, they were able to ex extend the patent another fifteen years. 
uh, and disincentivize people from trying to create a copy because the, the, the cost of doing it would be the same as the people who developed the original drug, which is insane. But okay, now I'm just preaching to the choir here. Because yeah. we all know that this I mean, is that was regular. one. That was another frustrating thing with like when I looked at it, counseling. It was like you were just. I mean, some drugs do help, but like it seemed like that's was another thing they wanted to just short term like drugs to to solve stuff. Then figure out a drug to put them on. Right? What's your problem? Depression. Yeah. Here's a drug. Yep. Oh, oh, and we have to give you this other drug because this drug has some side effects. Yeah. Well, it turns out that most psychological problems have nothing to do with, uh, like, a medical condition. Like, uh, you don't need to have drugs uh, for most psychological issues. And very often it's a um, philosophical problem. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that, I, that, I definitely that, think that's true, yeah. Like, I mean, when uh, Benito helped me uh, understand that I didn't, that it wasn't really a duty that I had, uh, it was a desire. And that, I mean, that really did, like, un undo a lot of, like, stuff. You know, it took a while to then, like, untangle some of that stuff, but it was, like, oh, okay. You know, like... Um, yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like duty is psychological poison if you think you have to do stuff. Yeah. I am... Um, I think that uh, in, in a few uh, cases, it, duty is good, not for me, but when someone else feels they need to have a duty. So like pedophiles who feels a duty not to rape children, like even if they don't have any like ins other incentives for it, if they are duty bound uh, for some reason and they stay away from children, well, uh, I like that. So uh, I can see why re religion had some kind of function in just keeping some bad apples from doing bad stuff by having a, a like a, a security cam in the sky, yeah. always and watching. A, like a little character that they were like chasing with cheat that was like kind of like dropping their values that they had to like pursue. That's right. So I, I see that, but to most people, the duty thing is like first of all it's unnecessary you don't need to appeal yeah. to duty and second of all it's it's then emotionally and psychologically damaging to your self-esteem yeah that that you don't really have an existence uh, outside of a duty duty bound goal um, but yeah all right well should we should we draw a line here on the subject of your secular yeah. churches That's Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, great talk. Yeah. Thanks for coming yeah. on. We will we'll put this out there and let everybody give their two bits on it. And... <laughs> yep. All right. Now I just All premiered. Right. I just did a premiered a video tonight. You guys saw that. You were waiting yeah. for me to get off that. So um, let me wait a couple days before I put this up so I don't spam uh, people's thing with okay. three hour long videos all day. That, <laughs> that's fine. All right. Um, so watch for it on the channel. All right, goody goody. All right, thanks for coming on, Omar. Thanks again, John. All right, goody goody. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. And if you appreciate what I do, please uh, patronize me. Uh, these definitely take time, and it takes my afternoon to make these things. So um, go to Patreon. Give me. Five, ten bucks, whatever you're able to afford. And if you can't afford it, then skip your coffee tomorrow. And uh, let's make Mr. Chop Mr. Cropper's channel great again. <laughs>